very much um and we thank you for inviting us to be here to perform today for this special event uh we hope you've enjoyed our music we're going to close now with our traditional closing number wherever we perform a medley of the armed forces songs so if you hear one of the armed forces songs that means has a special meaning to you please feel free to stand or raise your hand um, to be recognized again we thank you and we we'll maybe look forward to seeing you again in the future thank you First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might And the army goes rolling along Proud of all we have done fighting till the battle's won And the army goes rolling along That is high, high, hey, the army's on its way Count off your cadence loud and strong For wherever we go we will always know That the army goes rolling along from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We fight our country's battles in the air, on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marine. Anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to foreign shores, we sail at break of day. Through our last night on shore, drink to the foam. Until we meet once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to meet our thunder, and the boys give the gun. Down we dive, spouting our flame from under, off with one hell of a roar. We live, we live in faith, in faith. Go, down go down in flame, and nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. We're always ready for the call, we place our trust in Thee. Through surf and storm and howling gale, I shall our purpose be. Semper Paratus is our guide, our fame, our glory too. To fight, to save, or fight and die, I, Coast Guard, we are for you. Well, it is a real pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sally Snowman. Over the past year or two, I've um, had the opportunity to participate in the Boston Light 300th Planning Committee, which is a joint committee of Coast Guard personnel and civilian organizations that support um, Boston Light Celebration. And in that process, I have had the opportunity to see just how hard Sally Snowman has worked to make um, the 300th anniversary of Boston Light a really special event um, for really the entire Boston area and um, give many opportunities for the public to come out and celebrate that. So I'd like to personally thank you, Sally, for all your hard work on that. Dr. Snowman is uh, the 70th Keeper of Boston Light and the first woman keeper of Boston Light. She is also the author of Boston Light, A Historical Perspective, and the new book, um, New Images of America book, Boston Light, which is a fabulous book with many, many photographs um, that you probably have not seen before, of Boston Light and Little Brewster. Sally welcomes thousands of visitors every summer out to Boston Light and makes it a memorable experience for each and every one of them. And she is a tireless ambassador for Boston Light and Lighthouse history. So thank you so much, Sally. Uh, how many knew that it was Boston Light's 300th anniversary this year? Well, if you didn't, you know now. <laughs> And um, my husband, Jay Thompson, he's in the front row. Jay, you want to just say hi? Hello! <laughs> uh, are we up and running? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, okay. We might have some... Uh, um, 
until that gets going. Uh, as uh, Vicki had said, uh, I'm the first female keeper of Boston Light. And I love to say that I'm the 70th keeper and the first 69 were all men. <laughs> and there's a reason why I wear this costume is one of the things that um, I was before I went on the Coast Guard payroll was um, a volunteer with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And my husband um, and I met in the auxiliary, got married out of Boston. Like, you didn't know you were going to hear a love story, did you? And, um, and so how that all transpired into the job was that there were three active duty Coast Guard personnel out on the island. And after 9-11, um, the Coast Guard needed those three personnel for law enforcement type things and not being at a lighthouse, giving tours, mowing the lawn, things like that. So they civilianized it and it went on usajobs.com, which is where all federal jobs get posted and you apply. Well, lo and behold, I didn't think I had a chance because I haven't had any other um, civic paying jobs and I thought that it would be going to a retired veteran or something like that and was very, very um, pleasantly surprised when I got the phone call to say that I was hired. So I went from a volunteer capacity to being on the payroll. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is a dream come true as a little girl growing up in the harbor to think of being a lighthouse keeper at Boston Light. That was pretty amazing. And here I am standing in front of you during his 300th anniversary and being the keeper of the light for that. So it is such a, an honor to be able to speak with you today. And our birthday was on the 14th of September. And um, we actually are going to start the presentation with um, what that looked like. And what was so special about that day for me is I think we had the highest ranking person in the country on the island ever in all its 300th year. It was, a con it was a commandant of the Coast Guard. And the commandant of the Coast Guard is, is the fourth in the pecking order. There's, um, uh, through the country, there's a, a president of the United States, and there's a vice president, there's a homeland security, and then the person, the next agency under the secretary of, an, of the homeland security is the Coast Guard. And so that individual, the number four person in the country, was on Little Booster Island on the 14th of September. And I got to take him on a personal tour of the lighthouse, climbing the 76 file stairs and the two ladders and taking them to the gear room and the lantern room and out on the deck outside. Um, and his wife was just an amazing person herself. So I'm still a little high on that, um, even though it's been a month since um, that has occurred. And so the question is, as you heard during Eric's presentation, that the tower out there, the original one built in 1716, the British blew it up in 1776, so this is the new one, 1783. And the oldest standing tower is Sandy Hook in New Jersey, and they're proud of that. And whenever we have visitors to the island, I always say, if we have any New Jerseyites, did you know you have the oldest standing tower in the country? And some know that and some don't. And if it was Sandy Hook, New Jersey, it was built in 1764, although the British fired upon it and it, and it sustained damage, it is still functioning to this day. So with, um, with Little Booster Island, the tower was rebuilt in 1783. So the garb that I'm wearing is what the women wore of that era. And the reason being is the Coast Guard, when they hired me, said, you can't wear your Coast Guard auxiliary uniform because now you're on the payroll. So what are you going to wear? And I said, just you wait and see. Because they wanted me to stand out from the crowd. And so, do I stand out from the crowd? <laughs> So um, this is Little Booster Island, and how many here are from Howell, Hingham, that area? So you can see it, if we stepped outside, opened one of these doors and went out on a little balcony here, we could see three lighthouses. Mine is down at the right, Grace light around 10 o'clock and about 11 o'clock, and then go over from about, you know, nine, nine and a half o'clock, we would see Boston Light. And it, um, did you know that Little Booster Island was once owned by the town of Hull? Yes. And that is why the Boston Light is on the logo of your town. 
because what was happening is that when there was, um, there were two choices to put the lighthouse back in 1716. Was it going to be here in Hull on Point Oliden? Or was it going to be on one of the islands, um, uh, one of the Brewster Islands or, or the Wedges? And it was decided to be put on one of the islands because when ships wrecked along here, well, we have Sandy Beach here at Nantasket, and then around Point Oliden and, and the elbow part there, there's stones there, but it's not ledges where when ships crashed upon them, the hull would crack open like an eggshell and the cargo would go all over the bay, the ship would be permanently damaged, and a lot of people would die. Now, what was happening in the early 1700s? They were trying to colonize Boston to be an international port. Well, if they kept on losing the people that were supposed to be populating it and um, couldn't do the commerce piece, it was off to a rough start. So the tower was built in 1716 on Little Booster Island. So when you're coming over from Europe and you're taking your turn into Nantasket Roads, into Boston, you want to keep the light on your right and you want to keep Point Island and Point to your left. That, is, that was the main ship channel. What happened if they missed? They'd either end up with their cargo strewn in the harbor, or they'd end up here on the beach where they would have the opportunity to salvage the people and salvage the goods. So that's why they chose Little Booster Island, and that's why Hull helped to give the land away because they needed that protection too because they would be also losing the people that were coming over from Europe as the South Shore was trying to populize itself. So this is what Boston Light looks like today. There are six buildings on the island, and we'll see some archival pictures where there were more than that. And um, so we're looking at Coast Guard Light Station Boston, 1716 to 2016. And um, our welcome photo. This is our 300th logo. And Jay, could you stand up and show them your shirt? Isn't that the best? Our neighbors were involved, the Wallace, that you heard uh, Eric talking about. Lynn happens to be a graphic artist, and she took a pencil sketch by a Coast Guard petty officer, and we think she made it pop. Did you see the back, Jay? You sort of did a quickie. <laughs> Lighting the way forward since 1716. And so, as I said, our birthday party was on the 14th of September. Um, and what we did is, because Little Booster Island is so small, we limit the amount of visitors at any given time, 50. So we wanted to have a celebration on a bigger island where you could get a view of Boston Light and have it a family day. And so we did this on the 21st of August at George's Island on the day that was Everett O. Snow's birthday yearly celebration on the island. Did you know that Everett O. Snow had a pavilion named after him? for his love of George's Island and the history, and he was uh, one of those individuals that were responsible for getting it um, so that it was preserved. So those um, three rooftops that you see, that is the pavilion. We had over 550 people there on the 21st. And you know what drew them? It wasn't our birthday. It was flying Santa landing in a helicopter in Montilio's cake. You, you know Montilio's? They brought a 550 some odd huge cake. And so that's where everybody is huddling in the midship there with uh, Santa Claus in the middle of that as well. And uh, this is the cake. Isn't that amazing? The top part was made of styrofoam. So it was on a, a, a solid foundation and lifted it up in the blue water. That was the case. And um, people came out of the fort, the woodwork, to come and get their cake. And do you recognize the person on the right? She's in the room here today, Dolly. Uh, everyone's so daughter. So George Montilio and Dolly and myself um, did the honors of cutting the cake with Edgar Snow's sword, which he traditionally used for cutting the cake. And I gotta give you the, the side story, is Brian Tate, who's in, 
intricately involved with flying Santa gave Sally a hard time because Santa is supposed to cut the cake. <laughs> but if we waited for Santa, there would have been a riot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, uh, so after the 21st of August, we came into September 14th in that long wharf from Boston, you know, where the Marriott Hotel is. That's um, um, a long pier and it's open to the public. So it was a public ceremony that anyone that knew about it could come and... Um, and it was an appropriate place because one of the earlier petitioners for Boston Light was John George, one of the principles of Long Wharf, was the merchant. And so um, we had um, uh, the commandant there and the rear admiral of the first Coast Guard district, the um, Mayor. Governor of Mayor. Massachusetts, the, the mayor, the mayor of Boston. Yeah, the governor wasn't there, but the mayor was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there it is. The mayor of uh, Boston. Uh, his name was Walsh. And there we have a photo of the commandant to the right. Is Kathy Abbott? She is the president and CEO of Boston Harbor Now, which is the fundraising agency for the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. And then to the left of the, um, of the commandant is the um, superintendent of the, uh, here in Boston. And then to the far left that I've already been corrected by my husband is the mayor of Boston. And here we are on Little Booster Island. So after we had the shindig in Boston, there were 77 people that got on a ship and came out to Boston Light. And this is interesting. The dock at Boston Light is 50 feet long, and the ship was 100 feet. So it was creative how they extended the dock. That was interesting. So we have um, the Commandant and the Rear Admiral of the First Coast Guard District unveiling the plaque. And um, I, this is out of order, but one of our celebrations that we had a lot of fun with this summer is, did you know the Hull does an illumination ceremony every year? As a, um, as a remembering and a thank you for all of those maritime services. And we participated last year and this year, so these were our flares that we could, we can see you guys in this very beautiful Boston light, so I hope you guys saw us. And um, so how did we prepare for our 300th birthday? We had a, $1.5 million restoration project paid for by the Coast Guard. And for anyone that was viewed Boston Light from here uh, in 2014, it's like, what is that wrapped around the tower? What is that characteristic? Why isn't the light, the bright light flashing anymore? And as you can see, there's a little building, a tippity, tippity top. That was because the lantern room roof is copper and they refurbished it. So they built it all the way up there. I actually stood on the roof of the lighthouse and took a picture. Just 100 years from now, there'll be proof that we actually could get to the roof of the lantern room. And all the buildings got new roofs and um, got painted, and the keeper's house got new windows in it, which was kind of noisy living in it because we, they were working on the inside and the outside at the same time. And they didn't have any tours in 2014. You can see why. It would not be OSHA approved. It was Little Booster Campground with um, as many as 10 um, workers staying overnight at any given time. Uh, this is just what the grounds look like, all torn up. And you know what we found? I sure wish that Eric was here because what we discovered was the first Nine to 14 feet of the tower is the original. And here's the proof of the pudding. If you notice, there's, um, these are smaller, irregular granite stone. And then up here, they're more rectangular and more finished cut around. And so, and it's irregular. It isn't like nine feet all the way around. Um, we knew that in 1783, it took them a fraction of the time to rebuild the tower than the original. So we had, we had always thought that there had to be some sort of foundation there in order for them to rebuild it so quickly. Sedgwick was that. the same New England merchants 
always squeezing a penny. If there was anything left, they would have reused it. <laughs> uh, and so the tower has been restuccoed, so you can't see this. We know it's there, and so when visitors ask about that, if you can stand back and take a look at it, you can see it, but it doesn't step out on you like this picture here. And then um, the tower is said to be made of rubble stone, which is granite, unfinished rock. Well, what we saw in the previous picture, Jay, could you flip it back? Um, that you see that they're, they're big chunks of granite. And the next photo, you'll see that behind that facade is really chopped up small rock. They probably picked it up off the beach of Boston Light. We don't know. But what makes the tower conical shape is it's seven and a half feet thick at the bottom, two and a half feet thick at the top. That was the technology back then. I don't know if they have a different way of doing it, if they wanted to rebuild it exactly so that it would be rubble stone. We don't know. This way worked. <laughs> and um, so to me, I know that granite is gray and there's some whitish grayish colors and there's a light pink. And I saw this dark cherry color. So I said to the stone craft contractor, wow, I've never seen a dark cherry colored granite stone. I wonder where that came from. And he said, it came from something that was under pressure. And I said, oh, like an explosion from dynamite that blew up the tower in you know, 1776? The answer is yes. So here's a proof of the pudding that we actually have some of the original granite that is that was actually fired, you know, that heated up and made that color. Take a gunpowder did that. Yeah. Uh, and this is the keeper's house. Boy, this was a real challenge. Um, living, trying to do a maintaining uh, the routine of the day. And this is it almost finished. They hadn't finished painting the cellar yet. And here it is. And this. And this, this is the cistern building, and the fog signal building, and the tower. Now, anyone that is um, um, looking for official renditions or accurate renditions of Boston Light, there's two things to look for. Number one is how many rings are on the tower? And the rings were put on in 1809 because, Jay, you like to say this, the tower had this middle-aged spread problem that I live with. <laughs> so it put six steel rings around it to reinforce it. And, um, and now they are aluminum. They were replaced in 1976 or so. And so the question is, does the tower still need those? Like, um, what would happen if one broke and it fell off? Well, Lighthouses are lighthouses during the night, and they're day markers during the day. So each lighthouse has a characteristic, so any book that describes lighthouses for navigators that are running up and down the coast and across the oceans and things like that, and they see a lighthouse, they can read the description of the lighthouse and look at what they're looking and say, is that it or is that not? You're not going to confuse Minus Light and Graves Light with Boston Light because it's white, but the other helpful hint is it's got the rings. If we took the rings off, we'd have to change every publication that's out there that talks about Boston Light as a day mark and what it looks like. So those five rings are there forever because it's too complicated and too expensive and um, no reason to change that. And the other thing is the two decks are the galleries that are on top because we're going to be hearing the story about the classical Froland lens, and it didn't fit in the original lantern tower, which, lantern room, which is here. So they raised the tower to fit the Fresnel lens. So that's why there's two galleries, so they could go out um, in a storm and scrape off the ice of the snow. So why was there a need for a lighthouse? And I gave you that dialogue um, in the beginning. But we'll do a recap. We have um, over here, we've got Little Booster Island. Over here, we have the town of Hull and um, Point Holland and right here. 
So the question was, okay, if there's only enough money to build one lighthouse right now, where are we going to put it? It was decided to put it here. Because as the ships came in, they had to thread the needle, the one mile between um, the Brewster Islands and the elbow of Hull, to come in and then through what they call the Narrows, which is Lovells and Georges and Gallops, and then finish their way into town. And so shipwrecks were um, very prominent in this area. And a lot of people were mistaken for Graveslight's name. They think that it was named Graves because of all the people that went to the grave. Not so. It was named after the Graves family. And there's a, many of them that still live up in Gloucester, and they like to come and speak about the heritage of their family in Graveslight. We just lost our slide again. <laughs> okay, now the other thing is, we're going to get into a little story about the National and State Park. Notice everything that's green. The green areas are those that are within the Boston Harbor Islands and National State Park, which was established in 1996. <coughs> Technical difficulties. Uh, myself and electronics don't necessarily <laughs> work well together. Maybe I should, you know, move on the far right end of the room here. So um, we're going to talk about the Park Service um, now rather than waiting for the slide to come up. In, oh, okay. Thank you. So in 1716, with the new Boston Light lit, there were no photographs. They were just renditions and sketches and things like that of what it looked like. And look at all the trees on it. And we don't know whether there were really trees there. We figured by the first keeper, ninth winters there, um, Worthy Lake, that they were probably cut down for firewood and keep They warm. weren't already gone. Yeah. And um, we became a fog signal station in 1719. And um, I used to joke with the Coast Guard when Things got really anxious about the 300th birthday, and there's all sorts of things having to go on, and we were looking at, okay, well, it's going to be over after September 14th, and I'd say, oh, no, but we've got another 300th birthday in just three years, and then look that I would get for that. Because so many people don't even know that Boston Light is also a fog signal station, except for those who know when it malfunctions, and it goes on for days on end. Uh, and so the first fog signal was a cannon, a burnt out gun, a great gun to answer ships in the fog, fog um, requested by John Hayes, the third keeper. Now some reminiscences. We're just going to look at some archival photos. Um, after we had the fog signal cannon until 1851, that was a long time to have that cannon. And the question I have in my mind, how old were the children when they were taught how to fire off the black powder? Because sometimes the fog signals would go weeks on end. So if it was a keeper and a wife and a gaggle of kids, that could get pretty boring to be um, fact, firing it, it off. It was the fog signals and the lighting apparatus that brought on the assistant keepers because prior to that, they con the work off on the keeper and his family. Once we get into the technology, the middle of the 19th century, we started having assistant keepers. So in 1851, this is not the bell that was on the island, but it's one that we have on display as to represent it. And um, if you notice that um, we have a number of buildings on this end of the island, and what that's all about is the technology is what brought the need for more personnel, which Jay just mentioned. And they were always tinkering with finding the best possible fog signaling device to cut through that limited visibility. And this is just one example of the buildings and structures at this particular moment in time. They had a fog signal building that they wanted to rebuild, so they built temporary, they built a temporary one in front. And then they had to house the coal. They burnt 40,000 tons of coal a year. They bring 20 in in the spring and another 20 in in the fall. 
And that's the six band, if you're wondering right. about it. Yeah, the six band right here. And um, in 1859 is when we got the classical Fresnel lens. It's um, 11 feet tall, made up of 336 individual prisms. I call it the crystal Christmas tree. And because we're fully automated, this sucker turns 24-7. However, because it's so old, it has a tendency sometimes to malfunction. And so we have backup systems for that. Do you want to have technical difficulties, Jay? No, I was just <laughs> pointing out the backups. Okay. Um, and what we have is what rotates that? Now, there's two ways to rotate a classical lens. With a um, mercury bath, where it floats and there's a clockwork, and so it's frictionless. And then there were these chariot wheels. Now, Boston Light, because it was an earlier lighthouse to get the lights and they weren't into mercury yet, they got the wheels. It's a really good thing because when it was discovered how toxic mercury is, the Coast Guard took all the mercury baths with the lenses out. So the lenses that had the mercury baths were Long Island Headlight, Minus Light, Graves Light, we were the only ones in the harbor that had the chariot wheels. And that's why we get to use it. So if the light got built any later than this, it would have had a, it would have had a, um, or the correction. If they had brought in the, um, the Fresnel lens after this time, it probably would have been mercury. And I always thought the term wacky wicky had something to do with the isolated living conditions. I think they probably had something in common with the Mad Hatters. <laughs> uh, this is a fabulous picture um, of 1890 because they had photography back then. And um, lots of happening here. Uh, there's a connector between this assistant keeper's house. The assistant keeper was on the right, the principal people are on the left. And so they didn't have to go outside to tend the light. They had a connector into the oil room. And this is the oil room. How many here have been out to Boston Light and, and actually been at the base of the tower? Do you ever go into the museum room? Well, this is it, folks. This is what we now call a museum room. Doesn't look anything like this, does it? And, and what's amazing here is that there's four, um, no, four containers with locks on them because oil was very expensive. And the keeper's pay was not always the best, and so they had sometimes a tendency to sell off the oil. <laughs> so it was literally kept out of the lock and key. And if you look in the upper left, there's um, hurricane lanterns and there's wicking. And this photograph is um, around um, 1874. And we have to share this one. Not only did we have the light station, but we also had the light saving station, literally a mile apart from each other. And um, so this is an example of how you could see what was happening if there was a shipwreck or what have you. There were a flag signal system from Boston Light to let the, um, the life saving people know of this. And, and working with Vicki, we still have not been able to find or locate what that flag, um, flag system might have been. So we're still trying to figure that out. But this is a wonderful picture of the Hull Life Saving Station personnel with uh, Joshua James is right here. And um, <laughs> he's a shipwreck. What had happened with this particular boat was it totally missed the turn into Nantasket Roads and went between Great Booster and Little Booster Island and tried to cut across the bar and but didn't know the bar was there. Uh, so this is just an example that happens today. We still have people that go around all the time. It now. happened this spring. It happened this spring, yeah. And then this is a, another awesome picture. And this photo was... Um, Donated by Jim Linsky. He's right here in this room. Um, one of the um, very prominent people in the town of Hull. And he had that hanging on his wall. 
in his office and he brought it into one of our 300 meetings and said, look at this photo. And looking to identify the actual age and what the event may have been. 1917. We put it. 1917? 1917, it was, uh, uh, there was an overflight by um, a uh, army plane from Fort One and it was flying over Boston Light and Point Allerton and that was the Point Allerton station crew and that was a BB motor surf boat, um, and, uh, which was one of the first model motor surf boats. And uh, that's why they're looking up and why they're waving in there. Well, I did a lot of research trying to find what was happening in that time. So we said circa 1915, but it was 1917. We'll fix that. And you get, look at the flag that's flying and the salute they're doing. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. We just love this picture. I did not take the picture. I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that clarification. If you didn't hear it, he said he did not take the picture. And this is the 1918 circa. And if you notice, we have another house on the island. That is, uh, that was the principal's keeper's house because as they had technology, they needed more people to handle the technology. And um, can you so, see where the keeper's house is? And that's the fog signal. There's privileges to rank. <laughs> okay. And um, this is the, um, the keeper's house that you saw earlier grown up. Um, it raised the roof and um, made two separate entrances instead of having one and made a fancy stairwell and a fancy door to go in on a deck. And they took the connector from the assistant keeper's house to the museum. And so you'll see a solid wall there. And then in um, 1916, we had a 200th anniversary, and this is the plaque. The 300th anniversary plaque that you saw in the beginning of the program is going to be just down below this one in the entrance to the tower. And this is a, a photograph. This one, and Jay, just want to leap to the next one, too. Remember that mention of 40,000 tons of coal? The dock, or the piers down this end, the fog signals down at the other end. So how did they get all the coal down there? Well, for about 20 years, they had a tram. And this is the, the best photo of it right here. But if you go back to the other one, just to look how it changed the profile of the island. Uh, another flying Santa picture. You can't talk about Boston Light without talking about flying Santa because every little snow was such an integral uh, part of the history of Boston Harbor. And one of the same places to go when we lived in the winter was to commune to Boston Light. So um, past keepers that we have seen um, writings of or even actually be able to talk to them would tell stories of Edward O. Snow showing up looking for a cup of coffee at just about any hour, any day of the week, rain or shine. And um, this is an interesting photo. Um, once they realized that oil was the way to go for, um, um, fuel. for fuel of the frog signal, they switched to uh, oil, fossil fuel, and this was the oil boat that was coming into the dock. So for a few years they were getting 20 tons of coal. They were a mixture of coal and oil because there were also the two keepers houses with three furnaces that were coal that needed to be con converted to oil. Anybody that's been out to the light recently and want to know what that rusty iron thing is on the north side, well this is the sheet pile pier when it was looking pretty good. Yeah, the island had two piers, um, which we'll see some aerial shots. And um, this is flying Santa uh, dropping the, um, the goodie. And it was a good thing it was low tide, because it would have ended up in the water if it was high tide. And one of my favorite details, of course, is the duplex outhouse. We didn't get indoor plumbing till the mid-50s. Thanks to my father. <laughs> and um, in Edward Snow, well, this wasn't Edward Snow's. This um, I'm using this for another story. Edward Snow had groupies 
and they would call the um, Ramblers. The Ramblers. And they would come and hang out at Little we Bistro just, Island. We just got a clarification from Dolly. They were the Harbor Ramblers. Oh my goodness, the Harbor. We'll have to make a correction, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. As opposed to the automobile. Okay. And so here, some are, they had a dinghy in their swimming. And um, so this is a picture of the island. It actually shows you how small it is with an acre and a half with one pier here. And then we have the two piers. This was from Station Point Olive in here. The, uh, the lighthouse station boat was in the, in the boathouse. And the boat would be brought into the boathouse with this one horse engine. And how did they paint the tower? <laughs> By dropping down from the gallery and painting. And they were still doing this into the 70s. Uh, this is a great photo of the two piers in, in intact. Boston's over here. The westerly prevailing winds, it can get very rough out here. So by having the two piers, they could get the station boat in, up the railway, into the boathouse. Another thing that's fairly intact is the seawall on Great Brewster. And if you notice that there's still two houses, the principal keeper's house and the assistant keeper's house. And this was just before they were going to destroy the house because it went from um, um, family. the family to a stag, which was just all men in 1960. And Eric mentioned that that, that was the, um, the Boston, I mean, the Coast Guard modernization process. And so if we look at the next area, ah, the house is gone. And the island hasn't changed significantly. If, we, if you fly over to the island, like this all well, this is dated 1961, it hasn't changed. And now um, we're going to talk about that park service access, and we can um, just recap what I said before. Before we had the park service tours beginning in 1999, the way you got to the island is that at the base of the pier and going up the ladder. And we can't have tours and having the people get onto the island that way. So the park service, um, oh yeah, the way you can get there is by landing by boat. <laughs> uh, and so we have a partnership that allows um, public access to the island. And the, the park service built this $1.8 million docking system so that they could bring their visitors out. And this is what it looks like once you step on the pier. The dock, sorry. And the way the Park Service provides the tours is through a chartered vessel from UMass Boston the Marine Division called the Columbia Point. We take up to 40 people on a tour, and it backs in. This is unusual. You usually come, you know, port or starboard, or you bow in. This one sterns in. Come off the boat, come up to the boathouse for welcoming. And we have a variety of staff. The one in the middle is the Ranger outfit, the one on the left is Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the one on the right is the Friends of Boston Harbor Island. And um, this is the, our visitor center in the boathouse. Then we have our cistern building and the entrance to the tower. Now, sometimes when you visit places, you have a guided tour, you get a guide and they walk you around. We don't do that at Boston Light. We have the staff be at certain places like the boathouse, outside the museum, the cistern building. So if you want to go and chat with them and ask questions, you can. But if you just want to watch the sea seagulls go by and have a lunch, you can do that. And this is the oil room turned into museum room. The door used to be right there that led into uh, toward the assistant keeper's house. And then there's 76 spiral stairs, a ladder into the gear room, Climbing in there, you can climb on your hands and knees if you need to. Gracefulness is not important. And the thing is, is that when you go in the gear room, that light is rotating 360 degrees, 24-7. What's rotating that is these gears work. So we have a small confined space where we have no more than eight people at a time go up there. And then they go up another ladder into the lantern room to see the far expanse of the universe. And the other people are 
and they're in the, the rotating. And it's very unusual in the United States to be able to climb a tower and go into the lantern room with the original lens in it. We're very special to have this in Boston Harbor. And then you get views of Boston. And I like to tell people that if they look up to sea, 3,000 miles away is Portugal. So if you just went, left Boston Light and went due east, that's what you're in. And then you leave. The tour is about 90 minutes. And then what are some of the milestones? Well, we went from um, what we call an incandescent vapor oil lamp to electricity in 1948. Right now we have a 13,000 foot uh, extension cord from Wimble Point in Hull over to Little Booster Island. And then we became a national landmark in 1964. And the Coast Guard actually put the National Park Service shield on the sign. Kind of cool. What happened to the red roofs, folks? Go. 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 Okay, so what happened? Did you know what those shingles were made of? Jablo and Lightness. They, they were asbestos, but that color red wasn't because it was pretty. It was because the most durable material at the time was crushed bricks. So that was crushed red bricks that you were looking at. And it was asbestos. And we get our water from the rain that goes down the gutters into a cistern. So um, it was toxic. So they had to change the red roofs to back to what they used to be, shingles, uh, wood, um, wooden shingles. So we have yellow Alaskan cedar on our roof right now out there. Another one um, milestone was, it was um, active duty personnel from 1942 to 2003. <coughs> Prior to that, it was civilian. So when we went back to civilian, when I got hired in 2003, I can't believe I had the job, I've been on the payroll for 13 years, that um, there, were, there was a, I don't want to say outcry that's over dramatic, but people really thought that things were changing big time because the active duty were leaving the island. Well, I mean, a couple hundred years it had always been civilian, so it just went back the way it was. So this was a, uh, Jay likes to call it, uh, my Pavarotti par 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 yes, par day. And then the last uh, active duty Coast Guard out there was Ben O'Brien. And um, in June of 2004, he signed up for another four years. And, Brian, and Ben just retired from the Coast Guard this past April, and he's back in the area. And one of the traditions is to carve your name in the stone. And that was what Brian was doing, uh, Ben was doing um, in June of 2004. Uh, and Sammy, the lighthouse dog, he was, and this is funny that Eric was mentioning that, that he got some negative airplay on Boston Lighthouse. Um, I use that interchangeably. Look at the name of the book, The Boston Lighthouse Dog. So I have no idea who the, um, that thought that that was so wrong to call it that. When you read the history of Boston Light, it's called lots of things. Boston Harbor Light, Boston Lighthouse, Boston Light. So um, it's now Coast Guard Station, Light Station Boston. That's the official name right now. So Sammy was the last official Coast Guard lighthouse dog in the entire country. And he and I were good buddies, and so I wrote a book about him. Isn't he just the cutest? He died of, of, of just old age. And then people always say, you know, this, you get to stay out there in the wintertime? Well, we used to. Um, in 2011, I was out there during a storm that was worse than it was supposed to be. That is the last time that we were allowed to be out there in a storm. So we get to go out there in the wintertime when sea weather and, sea, and uh, weather conditions permit us. So right now we've sort of transitioned onto the mainland because we were supposed to get a hurricane, Matthew, and so we use that opportunity to um, do transition. But whenever we can get out there, we do. It's just that when I took the job in 2003, 
a lot of the time I could spend, you know, like fifty percent of the winter out there. Then it dropped down to twenty, just because the weather has changed. Sally does a good job tracking the weather, so she is proactive and always looks good because we evacuate the island before she gets told to. And so this was just these, and this was when um, that piling set for the tour. Look at the way the seas are going over it. Okay, and this is what it looked like. Jay, we're just going to quickly finish up when you're the end. The lens restoration in 2005, 2006. Uh, beautiful, gorgeous. And the wheels, we still, if, the, if you see the light not working, it's because of these wheels. And then Coast Guard Station for the Point Olive is the one that supports us. They um, bring contractors out and things like that. And then um, the continue. Do we need a lighthouse still? <laughs> People have to pay attention to it, folks. Yes. And this is our backup system with um, solar power. Solar power, yes. And that's our close-up of our backup light and our fog signal. And we're back to our 300. So thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. And before we go, I just want to thank all of our volunteers who have been so helpful today with registration and food and Greg Bennett, who's filming the health table. So thank you very much.